the more I listen to that song this week, that great hymn, just cherishing it more and more. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the 131st Psalm. As we conclude this brief pause from our study through Luke, looking at various texts beginning on the 27th of December last week and then concluding this week, just thinking about the past year and the new year. And what the Lord has for us as a church body. Before we consider this psalm together, let's pray. Father, thank you for the great writer of this great hymn, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul. This year, this past year, has been one where we have needed, as always, to turn to you as our great refuge. And now as we consider these verses here in the 131st Psalm, to see ourselves, for those who are in Christ, rejoicing, changed, and for those who are apart from Christ, may they hear of your greatness and your goodness and kindness that you would use this psalm, Holy Spirit, in pointing them to Jesus, and that they would put their trust and faith in Christ alone because of the proclamation of your word. Hear our prayer, O God. Answer it according to your providence. In Jesus' name, amen. 2020 was indeed a very difficult year. I think we can all agree to that. I don't think there's anybody that would disagree with that statement. What happened in 2020, though, I'm sure of this, of all the things that happened, one thing has happened for sure, I could probably guarantee in every one of us, and that is this. There were hidden areas of sin that were exposed in every one of us. Perhaps that sin was hidden just because of the relative life, the ease of life that we had and the freedoms we had prior to the whole COVID issue coming on. When it took full force, and I remember, I still have the bulletin in my Bible, that March 8th was our last service where we had everybody together and then waiting and walking through the rest of 2020. It was interesting how easily not only myself, but so many others could become so easily engrossed and the politics and the thought of the day as we, as we kind of walked through and journeyed through 2020 together. As government tried to figure out things related to COVID. But, but then there's all the different ramifications of that. And especially how it affected us as a church body and not just us, but every church body. So there was that. There was the political side, the thoughts of the day. Too often than not, I think the sin that was hidden by maybe some of the ease that we had and the freedoms that we had were because we didn't see this and maybe we, some of us continue to not see this as a means of God's grace and his mercy to point us to Christ, to point us to his dependency, or our dependency, excuse me, upon him, to see our present circumstances through the lens of Scripture, to see what and how the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, has worked, is working, and continues to work in our lives individually and corporately as a body. Whether or not that has come through a lack of trust, a lack of faith, a growth in fear, perhaps, or even through this balancing act of wisdom and discernment, Showing love for others and balancing that out with reality. It's been a challenge. And, and at times through all this, there has been a time to, to reject, so to speak, extremes at both ends. In, in all of this, what 2020 has shown us is that all of us still wrestle with pride. We still wrestle with arrogance. We still wrestle with a lack of contentment. And I would even pose that it has shown us that we even lack in our consideration for loving others at various times. Not all the time. 
I'm, I'm speaking from my own heart and the things that the Lord has taught me. And I'm sure the things he has taught all of us together. What, what 2020 has in, indeed shown us is how much Psalm 131 is still a reality in the life of every believer. Why would this psalm by David, this song of ascents or of pilgrimage, come here? The, the best answer, the most obvious answer, is because it's Psalm 131, and so obviously Psalm 131 is going to follow Psalm 130, right? That would be the obvious answer. We're not, we're not given a lot of historical background to when David wrote this or why specifically David wrote this. Did he write this early on in his kingship or later on in his kingship? What, what's interesting to note that when we read through 130, and I, I'm going to read Psalm 130, and then I'm going to come back and read Psalm 131, so please follow along as I read here, Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And so we have in this psalm a great picture here of great work of God's grace in salvation that is manifested apart from any human works. And then when we come to Psalm 131, we, we see here David writes of this humble trust in God, which should actually follow for those who have been saved. And so we can see a, a great connection here between these two psalms. This pilgrimage in this journey in grace. Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher, said this regarding Psalm 131. It is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. End quote. And with that in mind, let me read Psalm 131. Hear now the word of the Lord. A song of ascents of David. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I've calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. May the Lord bless the reading of his word as the Holy Spirit makes right and proper application of it. There are four of David's psalms here among the, the songs of ascents, beginning back in Psalm 120, going all the way up through Psalm 134. There are four of David's, 122, 124, here in 131, and then a little bit later in the 133rd Psalm. This is the third one that David has written. We're not sure how this is connected, as I said, to David's life or when he wrote this. But we are to see here that in David's life, he was showing and expressing a confidence in God alone. His confidence was no longer in himself, but it was in God. When we read this in conjunction with, with Psalm 130, where he, he says there in verse 7, well, if even backing up to verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. Verse 6, my soul waits for the Lord. Verse 7, O Israel, hope in the Lord. We, we see here in Psalm 131 what this hoping and waiting actually looks like. And so this morning, as we look at these three brief verses, considering this psalm not only in light of 2020, but in light of 2021, and for that matter, every year afterwards, should the Lord tarry to keep us alive or Christ returns. It is my prayer, not only for me, but for us together, that we would see the goodness and the greatness and the faithfulness of God more clearly and that it would be lived out more faithfully and more clearly in our lives here in this new year. 
for all who are in Christ. And how might we do that? Well, I would like us to notice three areas of personal dependence on God that Davis, David excuse me, displays here. They are these. One, in verse 1, we see this area of humility. In, in verse 2, there is this personal dependence on, on God as seen by the inner peace that comes to David in his life. And then finally, in verse 3, Apart from the humility and this inner peace that has come, David then recognizes that he must and ought to and does minister with others. These are the three areas, humility, inner peace, and ministry to and with others. So let's consider first humility, verse 1. He, he says there, and you, you, you may not get that, you know, as I've read this in the past, it seemed like David was very downtrodden. But when we look at it in the original, he's actually saying here, Oh Lord, my heart is not proud. It, it's, it's not lifted up. How he is saying here and recognizing, I am not overly confident in my own being, in my own abilities, in my own greatness, in my own worth. He has depending on what circumstances led to him writing this, where he was depending on his own strengths, his own abilities, his own worth, perhaps because he was king, and he could make decisions that affected the whole nation. But he has come to this point where he begins with his heart. My heart is not proud. As one commentator said, as he begins with his heart, for that is the center of our nature, and if pride be there, it defiles everything. End quote. Learning to subdue pride is an important lesson in the growth of every Christian in our character. To recognize it, to confess it, to repent of it, to acknowledge it even in others, perhaps. In, in loving acknowledgement but to see the pride that we all wrestle with. David recognizes here at the very beginning of this particular psalm, he has been humbled and has recognized the pride that was in his own life. And he turns and cries out to the Lord. He doesn't cry out to those around him, his, his uh, advisors, his wife, his, his own children even. He cries out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my heart is not proud. It's not proud any longer. And the, the, the scriptures have much to say about pride and humility. I mean, later on in the 138th Psalm, just a few Psalms over, in verse 6, though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. David recognizes. That it's the Lord alone who does wonders. We heard it this morning in the 136th Psalm of the greatness and the glories of God and his wonders. And, and because of that, who are we to think that we can rest in our own strengths and achievements? We've got to be on guard for the pride that lurks in the background and then jumps out at various times in our lives and I can assure you, this is an area we all wrestle with. This is an area I wrestle with and have wrestled with and continue. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. Together, we work together in living life as a body, but to do it in humility. He goes on then, now in the next part of verse 1. He moves from the inside, dealing with his heart, to the outside. He says there, my eyes are not raised too high. He's saying, in essence, the word in other translations is, my eyes are not arrogant. This pride that, that stirs up and drives things on the inside is now being able to be seen in how it is coming out in his life. And the effects on others, they are not haughty. How his pride has been expressed through arrogance. It, it's this looking down, the idea, the picture that David is getting at here, this looking down on other people. 
We see that. We've witnessed that. I dare say we've been a part of that. We, we see people trying to cause these great divisions based on socioeconomic classes. But for those who are in Christ, we are a people of God together. David is saying here, I'm not arrogant anymore. There was a point when I was. But Lord, you have humbled me. And in my humility, I cannot be arrogant in how I act. What David is, is getting at here by this statement is he is reminded that where he was and where others are, the, the arrogant, proud person puts himself in the place of God. They want to move up to these positions in, in reality to take the place of God, from which then that person is able to look down upon others. But this isn't where David is. Perhaps he was this way when he looked down from his rooftop and saw Bathsheba and everything that unfolded because of that, his sin, the killing of Uriah, other areas as he served the nation of Israel. We must guard against, brothers and sisters, not only the pride within, but the arrogance that can come without. That we would recognize that and see that in our lives. And even perhaps if, if God is kind enough to use others to point that out in our lives and not become offended by it, but to, to be grateful for it. And thank God for it. I mean, you think about it and all throughout the wisdom literature. It, it deals with the wicked and the pride that is there. I, I think of verses 13 and 14 of Psalm 30, or excuse me, Proverbs 30. There are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift. There are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives to devour the poor from off the earth, the needy from among mankind. And then you think about, in, in Proverbs 6, the things that the Lord hates, the things that the Lord detests there in verse 6. Beginning in verse 16. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. So David comes back. He recognizes the pride that was in his heart and how it was shown through his arrogance. He is humbled by the work of God's grace in his life. But he doesn't stop there. He says, not only has my pride been exposed, the arrogance of my life has been exposed, but he finishes up verse 1 there, I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Those things lead me to put myself in a position equal or even above God, and yet... There are things I don't even understand. They are too great for me to understand. But God, you are the one who knows those things. And he submits himself to the sovereign rule of God Almighty. He understands his place. And in a time and day when so many see themselves and the need to put them in higher places of authority, and what they know and why they know it, dictating to others, looking down upon them. We must have the sense of humility to say we don't know everything. To serve together in humility and walk together in humility. But, but then he writes verse 2 here, and note this second area of personal dependence. He says, I didn't have a peace, and now I do have this inner peace. We have seen in 2020 just a great outpouring of unrest all throughout the year. And that is probably not going to stop in various areas for various reasons. Because of the sinfulness of man's heart. And yet, 
David goes from the negative to really the positive here. He says here when he writes this in verse 2, But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. David has learned to trust God completely in all of his circumstances. Like this weaned child who has learned to trust in his mother. Now, we have to understand here. In the ancient Near East, oftentimes a child was not weaned from breastfeeding from his mother until perhaps two years of age or or maybe even longer. And, And you think about the effects of that weaning time. As that child grew older and understood that this mother was trying to re- wean him from this, that it was time to move on to other food, more solid foods, the temper tantrums that would come up, the stomping of the feet, the, the yelling perhaps, the screaming and crying, shaking of the head, kicking of the dirt floor perhaps. But that mother knew what was best for that child. This child was be- being denied his great comfort And wanted that great comfort. And yet his mother knows what is best. This this is a beautiful picture of how David has been transformed because of the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God. That he now has this inner peace that he didn't have at some point in his life prior to this. I I also think about the, the child that is nursing having four children of my own, and to, to think through. When, when those babies, when they were done, done nursing, they were so content. They were so peaceful. They had such a calmness about them. I remember I, I would do this with all of my kids. I would pick up their hand and drop it, and it would just fall, and they wouldn't bat an eyelash. They wouldn't blink. They wouldn't move. I'd open their eyes and watch their eyes rolling all over in their head because they were so content and peaceful. It did not disrupt their sleep. Here is a beautiful picture, brothers and sisters, of where David is at. He has complete trust in God's providence for his life. So we have to ask the question, like that child who's being weaned from his mother and all the discomforts that it brings, and all the discomforts that we have been weaned from, so to speak, as we look back on 2020, how might we submit to his authority better, to the Lord's authority, without any mumbling or grumbling or complaining, even in our thoughts, let alone outwardly, verbally? He even asked the question, do we find delight in this weaning? That child, as he was weaned from his mother and throwing those fits, came to an understanding in this process of maturing, even as a child, that mom knew what was best for him. And that that mother loves that child. And David recognizes just how great God's love is for him and how great God's love is for us. He has found his contentment and his satisfaction completely in God and his providence regardless of outcomes. Here in this verse, he compares himself to that child. He he understood that this weaning didn't come naturally. I mean, you think about the story of David and Bathsheba, how David tried to manipulate the storyline. And all that God had in store for him. And yet now he is at this point in his life where he is completely confident and trustworthy of the Lord. I mean, in essence, prior to David coming to this point, he was only looking to God as far as what he could get from God. And how often, perhaps, have you and I, I I think of even Christians in the culture today, who view God this way. I'll trust in you, God. I'll I'll follow you and, and read your word and do these things as long as this, this, and this happen, perhaps. They put these qualifiers on. 
instead of simply resting and trusting in the sovereign providence of God. Now, that doesn't mean we just sit back. We have choices to make. We have to make decisions. But in all of this, as we, as we walk together, as we serve together, as we love together, as we grow together, to keep encouraging each other and pointing out the confidence that we have because of Christ, because of the gospel that we trust faithfully in our great God. Which brings a final question here. Have you learned to love God merely for who he is and what he has done? Through the person and work of Christ as he sent his son and not merely for what you can get from him? This question stings. It's a question we must ask. So David has learned to trust him in this area of humility. He has full confidence in God now to have this inner peace. And he brings it all together here in verse 3. He says, The humility that has come because of my confidence in God and the peace that it brings, I cannot keep to myself. I must share this and remind others. And so he cries there in verse 3, O Israel, hope in the Lord. I am your king here on this earth, but there is a king greater who rules over all of us and all things. He says here he wants others to enjoy the same intimacy and contentment with the Lord that he is experiencing presently. He has come and taken time to enjoy this rest. These are words of encouragement for the people of Israel. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. You see, th this word, the verb hope there is not a passive verb. It's an active verb. It's living with this hope in active expectation day after day after day. So here we are. January 10th of 2021. So many unknowns concerning the medical field with COVID, concerning the political field with an outgoing president and an ingoing president and Congress and everything else, and that will continue to go on. And yet our God is still and always in control of these things. David has to. He can't help but remind Israel we cannot put our hope and trust in ourselves. We must put our hope and trust and confidence in the Lord now and in every day in the future. Just like we did in the past. When things were going well for us as a nation and there was peace. But to put our trust in Him. You can see why it is so beautiful and how and why Psalm 131 comes after Psalm 130. I wait for the Lord, verse 5, Psalm 130. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. And in my waiting, in my trusting, I now have complete and full confidence in God alone not in myself, not in how I am perceived by others. And so we must together, in humility and with full confidence and assurance, press on in this new year together, encouraging one another, building each other up, weeping with those who weep, serving alongside each other with the needs within this body and the needs outside in our community. And we live in communities with great needs. We, we have these three verses here before us and what a, what a call we have. For, for heirs in life, it's a call to repentance. A call to cry out to God and say, Oh Lord, forgive me. And knowing that I am forgiven in Christ in these areas 
of pride and arrogance. It, it's a call to thankfulness, thanking God to see his greatness and his goodness and his kindness and his mercy and his justice in our lives individually and corporally together as a church body and in the lives of other Christians that we're in contact with and we fellowship with. That we walk in humble confidence because Jesus is on the throne. That God is always good, that he is always trustworthy, despite what I or we think what is best for us. And sometimes we're right and oftentimes we're wrong. But David here expresses this humble confidence in the Lord because his view of God has changed. He's reminded of the Lord's tender care for his people for those who draw close to him through all circumstances. To see God's goodness and kindness. And so as we look back upon 2020, I'm sure you can recall times of pride and arrogance, a lack of confidence and contentment in God's providence. Where those things may have even ruled your heart for a time. I know I've confessed and repented of my own times in these areas. But now that you and I can say like David, like a weaned child is my soul within me. It does not mean life is going to be perfect and smooth. It has its very difficult and hard challenges. And some of those are present and some of those are to come. But here we are in 2021. Again, with the COVID vaccine making us rounds, a transition in government, talk of hardships among the people of God and the church of Christ and his body among true believers and true followers of Christ. And so how will we respond in this new year? Will we be like the wean child who has matured, who trusts in the, their loving parent who knows what is best for that child? To see here in this 131st Psalm, I think compels us and drives us forward to the life of Christ. To see this true picture of this contentment that he brings out in verse 2 at the very end of Jesus' life when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the peace that he has resting in what his Father knows is best. As he's in that garden preparing to be crucified on a Roman cross. Oh, brothers and sisters, may we have that same confidence and contentment as our Savior and Lord did in the garden there. And as we press on each day in this new year and every year ahead, as the Lord tarries, to walk in humility without arrogance, to walk in complete contentment to God's sovereign plan and his providence for our lives together and as families and individually and to share in that contentment and rejoice in goodness in the goodness of God. Oh, may 2021 be a year that in which the Lord just completely blows us away in what he's doing not only in your life and in my life and in our life, the people we've been praying for to come to faith in Christ, they come to faith in Christ. The growth we've been praying for as a church comes in 2021 despite whatever happens with COVID. And to give Him praise and glory. To love Christ more. To love the, the Word more. And to love one another more. No matter what our circumstances are but we are resting in Christ and we are resting in God through Christ together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this psalm is a glorious reminder of your infinite grace.
in mercy. It's a glorious reminder of your constant goodness and faithfulness. That despite ourselves, in your mercy you saved us. In drawing us, Holy Spirit, to the Savior, seeing our need of a Savior, a Redeemer, granting us the faith to believe and to live it out. We, we pray and ask, Holy Spirit, as you continue in this great work of ongoing sanctification in our lives together as a body, to serve each other and serve others well, allowing us to, to see and recognize the struggles that we faced in 2020, the challenges that were there, and to every day see your greatness. To see Christ in all of his splendor. That our Redeemer lives and is returning. And we thank you, O Christ, that you came to this earth even as we have been reminded of in the month of December of your great coming in the Incarnation, but that it was you who, who could only bear the wrath of the Father for the sins of your people so that we may have life, true life, everlasting life because of your great work on Calvary's cross and conquering death in your resurrection. Oh God, may 2021 be a year of unprecedented growth in our lives in all of these areas that we have seen in this 131st Psalm. To your glory, oh God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.